Our next guest has a truly remarkable story and one which she hopes will warn others against the power of online grooming. Well, seven years ago, Tarina Shakil told her family she was going on a beach holiday to Turkey when, in actual fact, she was going to Syria to join ISIS after being recruited on the internet. However, after realising she'd made a mistake, Tarina fled the war-torn country only to be arrested at Heathrow and sentenced to six years in prison. Well, now, after undergoing a programme of de-radicalisation, Tarina wants to use her experience to help others, including Shamima Begum, and she joins us now. Good morning. Thank you for coming in today. So, I think it's fair to say you had a, a pretty Western upbringing, weren't you? You, had yeah. a, you were a Spice Girls fan, you liked watching TOWIE, you had a Saturday job at Morrison's. Yeah. But then, in 2014, everything changed, and this began online. So, just explain what happened. So, it was at a time when I was in a really unhappy place mm -hmm. due to a breakdown in relationship and I was just generally feeling really lost, really, due to the breakdown of the relationship. I didn't feel like I had any direction in life. I just... I, I didn't know where life was going because life, as I thought that it was going to be, had been really taken away from me. Yeah. And due to that... due to everything that was going on, I was... that left me feeling very vulnerable. Yeah. And through that vulnerability, I was unfortunately groomed online. So how... You had a happy happy childhood. Yeah. Um, as Holly said, you know, sort of learning Spice Girls songs, Saturday job at Morrison's, all that sort of yeah. stuff. And yes, this, this relationship issue. But aside from that, um, quite a happy life. So how did, how did it happen? Where, where did it happen? Did you... Did you do you remember the first approach? I had reactivated social media and because it was at the time when fundraising for Palestine was going on and me and my friends would look for like marches and how to support the Palestine cause and I remember coming across prof profiles that were of people stood in front of a black flag so I initially assumed that they were in Palestine and the communication started from there, really. Did you know what the flag was? No, it wasn't until I started to talk to these people. And how did that communication start? I sent the first message. Which was what? Which was, um, are you in Palestine? Is everything OK? How are things there? And then I received a message back saying, we're not in Palestine. And I was like, where are you? And they were like, well, we're in Syria fighting. And I, I didn't know anything about it, which then... I inquired about it. So what was the appeal? What was it that was so appealing to that life that made you want to leave everything you knew? As I said, I was in a really vulnerable place. I felt very isolated from friends and family and through the process of grooming, I was kind of offered a sense of belonging and a sense of a chance to start a new life. And through the grooming process, we were always told that, you know, if you die in England, you're going to go to hell and mm -hmm. you need to make Hidra Hidra's is Islamic migration. So that was more of the appeal of right. making Islamic migration. And as well, I'm really isolated from friends, family. I feel lonely. I've got no direction. I don't know which direction my life's going in. Mm. The direction I thought it's going in, it's not happening that way. Maybe, as silly as it sounds, my happy ever after is in Syria. Maybe that is where I belong. Yeah. So you... Um... You tell your parents that you're going to go to a, a beach holiday in Turkey and, yeah. uh, and then you manage to work your way across the border into Syria. And it wasn't very long before you realised that you actually made something of a mistake. So yeah. when you got there, what was it like and what were you expecting? What did you think it was going to be? I think I had built up this idea in my head of that you could just go there and live, live a pretty normal life. I, I understand it's a war-torn country. But after getting there and just realising that it, the danger is... De it definitely became more apparent when I was there. Yes, I read about the danger online, I understood it was a war-torn country, but it wasn't until I was actually there that I realised, wow, this is really dangerous, and it's completely different to the life that I was used to in England. Um, even, you know, like, running a bath, having a bath, things like that. So... How were you brought... How, how did you know it was dangerous? What, what, what brought that to your, your attention? Because we would see people walking around with guns. Um, initially, when I first got there, I wasn't... Ex 
exposed to any bombs being dropped because we were on the outskirts of Raqqa. But as I got further into my time there, we were amongst bombings and things like that, really, gunshots. We weren't, I mean, as Phil said, this all sort of happened over a period of eight weeks, really. Yeah. And then you, you did something that was very dangerous because you escaped from there and you yeah. knew that if they'd have caught you, they'd have killed Absolutely, you. Yeah. So you had to get a bus, you had to bribe a taxi, taxi driver, you yeah. ran across to the border, um, at which point you have to get a flight home. What sort of reaction did you think you'd get once you got back? Did you know that you were going to be in trouble, that you were going to be arrested once you got to Heathrow? Whilst I was in Syria, um, messages were always passed on to me from professionals and they would always tell my family to say to me, just make sure you let her know that she's not in any trouble when she comes back to, in to England. We just want to have a chat with her or we just want to see what she may have seen while she was out there. So when I come home, I, I expected to be, have people speak to me. Mm. But when the plane actually landed after I was, I came back from Turkey, Several officers came onto the came onto the plane and escorted me off and read several charges out to me and I realised at that point I was under arrest. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial shock factor for me. Wasn't there a picture taken of you with an AK-47? That's a picture that I... yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can sort of imagine, if you have pictures like that taken, that you are going to be arrested when you get off an aeroplane. That's not a great picture. No, that was... That was taken from my phone after the plea. They didn't know. They had never seen that picture. Yeah, but oh. it still exists. No, I understand, yeah. And so, because it sounds, it sounds like, um, and you were, you know, I don't doubt for a second, you're very vulnerable. I mean, unbelievably naive to go there and think that, in your words, you could live a better life, and then come back and think that there wouldn't be consequences. And I think many people watching would think, what on earth did you expect when you came back? Well, I would have been expecting consequences, but when messages are continuously being relayed to me that she's not in any trouble when she comes home, what, you know, what, what am I supposed to believe if that's what's said yeah. to me? Mm -hmm. um, you, um, so, the, so then it's your back, uh, you're arrested, you end up uh, being put into prison six years, you serve three years of that time, uh, because you go into this programme, this de-radicalisation programme, did you feel like you needed that? Did that help? How did that work? Initially, I didn't think that I needed that. I thought, I can just carry on with my life. It, it's happened now. I just, I just want to put everything behind me and carry on. Yeah. But as I was going through it, I realised that I, I did need this. Um, it included working with psychologists, counselling and things like that. And like I said, it wasn't until I was actually participating in it that I realised this is actually helping me. I really needed this. I really needed a chance to speak to people. I really needed these conversations. Did you, yeah. did you realise then I was radicalised and I did begin to think in a different way? I think I realised the first time about being radicalised and groomed online when I was going through my court proceedings because um, there was other women that had given accounts that were exactly the same as mine. Yeah in terms of how they got over to Syria, how they were groomed online, the kinds of things that were said to them. And that was the first time I actually... And I actually remember it, thinking, oh, my God, mm. her, this woman's account is almost exactly the same as mm. mine, the things that she was told mm. before she ran away. Mm. And that was the moment that it really hit me, and I was like, wow, so I was groomed. Yeah. The, yeah, um, I... the judge said um, in his sentencing that you'd embraced ISIS. Um, messages were sent were intended to encourage people to commit, prepare and instigate acts of terrorism. Um, so, I mean, which is all, again, powerful stuff. Yeah. You, uh, say you've been groomed. Um, having returned and having, I'm assuming, completely given up that yeah. aspect of your life, um, is this, this is, I'm assuming, still happening to, to, to other vulnerable people? Absolutely, it's still happening. And it's an area that really needs a lot of attention. It's an area that needs a lot of educating because it, it's not right. You know, you essentially have people like myself who are just normal people, normal, happy background, as, as you said. And then through, yeah, I understand I'm the one that went on to travel to Syria, but I wouldn't have done that if it wasn't for the grooming process. Nobody ever just wakes up and says, right, I'm going to go and run away to Syria today. No, it happens because of the grooming process. Mm -hmm. And then when you really think about it and you think, wow, it's some, it's somebody has actually put their mind to it and it's their task to prey on other people's vulnerability. 
It's not right. It's, it's like not scanning. Fair. It on really a massive is. Massive scale, isn't it? On a much more dangerous scale. It really scale. is. And when I first found out, when I first realised that I had been groomed, like I just said, whilst going through the court proceedings, I felt I felt disgusted because I had not realised that that's, that's what it was. And I want to ask you about Shamima Begum yeah. because she was 15 yeah. when she left and went to Syria. I mean, she was there a lot longer than you were. She married. There were there were children. Um, what would your advice be to her? I mean, she has said that she was groomed, that she went through this process. It's exactly what you're saying now. We know that there's this de-radicalisation programme available. Should that be available to her? Should she be given a second chance? I think that the de-radicalisation process, that she should already be talking to people, because I know, as it stands, that she's not allowed to come home. But at some point in the future, she may well be allowed to come home. So I would hope that the rehabilitation process is kind of starting from now and that she is getting access to these mm -hmm. kinds of things, counselling, psychology, whatever it may be. With regards to do I think she should be allowed home, I can't sit here and say no because I've been in a similar situation and I've been allowed to come home, which I'm truly, truly grateful for and thank God that I was allowed to come mm -hmm. home because through that I was able to put everything behind me. But at the same time, I, I don't know a lot about risks that people pose and... I would like to think that we're all given a second chance and I would like to think that if she genuinely wants to come home mm -hmm. and, and has turned her back on this nightmare and she just wants to end it, I would like to think that at some point in the future that she is given a chance to do so. You, um, you want to set up your own sort of foundation yeah. um, it's for people who, uh, who might need help in this area. Could you have been stopped? If your f family had said, tonight what you're doing there, could you have been stopped? Yeah. And, and, and that leads on to the question of if someone in your family, you believe this is the case, can they be stopped? I think in, in certain situations, yes. Myself, if, if I had have made it aware to my family, which I think is why I didn't make them aware, I was very secret about it, I didn't tell anyone I was going to Syria. Yeah, because we're a really close family, so it would have inevitably stopped me. In most cases, I would say yes. But unfortunately, I have seen, I've read about cases where even when families have notified whatever organisation it may be, it wasn't enough to stop and help. But in most cases, I would... What do you want to achieve with your new foundation? I know you're waiting for the paperwork to come through. Hmm. Yeah, I, I really want... So there's two aspects of it. I really want to educate and advise and mentor with issues regarding grooming, particularly online, because, like I said before, it's an area that requires a lot of attention. It still happens to this day. And it's something that's really close to my heart and I'm... In any way, if I can help educate people, because we spend a lot of time online, particularly younger people, and I think it's only fair that we educate them, because once you are groomed and you end up going down that path, it's very difficult to come back from it. Mm -hmm. And if we can stop people from going down that path, if I can, due to things I've been through, I would love to do that. The other side of it is... I hope that we can be involved in the rehabilitation and reintegration of people like myself who have terrorism convictions or are due back to their countries, that we can be part of the rehabilitation po process and help them reintegrate themselves back into society because it's something I have been through mm. and, you know, I have great life experience in that field and I, I would love to help in whichever way I can, really. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming thank here you. and telling us your story. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.